So this week I knew that today was Memorial Day weekend and thought we uh, thought we might be outside. And as the week went on, I sent a text to my father and said, well, I think I'm going to call it and I think we ought to be inside because the backyard still had its standing water and uh, a pond in it from last week, and uh, which meant the ground was soft. And so if we took chairs outside and we sat in them, that's what we would do, right? Of course, if we did that, it makes it easier to get on our knees and pray, isn't it? Especially if the Lord calls us to repent, it gets easier to just, we don't have to get up and move to the altar, we just kneel, right? Okay. So, um, I, mean, I was praying about what the Lord would have me share this morning, and uh, this is kind of what he laid on my heart. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. And there's no slides this morning because we were supposed to be outside, so there's no slides this morning. So it's kind of a, a fun message, hopefully. Um, and uh, kind of a, just a easy thing, but hopefully the Lord speaks to you and challenges you all at the same time. Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, it says, Examine yourselves. See, doesn't that sound like fun? Examine yourselves to see whether you are still in the Christian faith. Now, see, doesn't that sounds like fun to me, right? Y'all saying, what did you drink this morning? Well, it goes on and says, test yourselves. So examine yourselves. Test yourselves. Don't you recognize that you are people in whom Jesus Christ lives? Now Paul's writing to the Corinthian church. Corinthian church was the most perfect church in all of the world. Now, if you know anything about the Corinthian church, you know that that is not a true statement. The Corinthian church was one of the most messed up churches in all of the world at the time. And Paul was writing to them, and he says, Examine yourselves, test yourselves. Don't you recognize that you are people in whom Jesus Christ lives? If Paul were writing to us today, I wonder what he would say to us today. I wonder if he would say the same things to the church today. Church of God, Anderson, Indiana, examine yourselves to see whether you are still in the Christian faith. Columbus West, examine yourselves to see whether you are still in the Christian faith. Test yourselves. Don't you recognize that you are people in whom Jesus Christ lives? Aren't you having fun yet? Could it be that you're failing the test? <clears throat> we'll stop there. Because what I want to do is I want us to examine ourselves a little different. Um, we're going to take a trip today through the devil's drugstore today. All right? Uh, do you see yourself in the devil's drugstore? Joe, do you see yourself in the devil's drugstore? Joe says, I'm not coming back anymore. Many of us would sit in here, if I were to point each of you out, many of us would sit in here and say, no way, preacher. How in the world could you even suggest something like that? Many of you might be saying, well, bud, you're chairman of leadership. It's time to do a consensus and fire the preacher. To even suggest that we might be in the devil's drugstore. Now listen, I want you to approach this with an open mind and let's see whether we're, we're in the devil's drugstore. Because there are different brands and different types of Christians that Satan is working in and working through. 
Because many have the idea that you have to live up to some unreasonable standard. Way before you can walk through the doors of some church, of course, they probably got that idea that there is some uh, some standard. Uh, they probably got that idea of a self righteous Christ. You know, they 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 that that said you've got to do this and you've got to do that and you've got to stop this and you've got to stop that. You know, if if I can get well before I go to the hospital, then I really don't need the hospital. Man, I'd save a whole lot of money too. Jesus said it's not the well that need the physician, it's the sick. We need to realize that the church is not a hotel for the saints. It's a hospital for sinners. We need to also realize that there are Christians who are out here that do more harm for the cause of Christ than any sinner who is living in sin. I've heard that there are two reasons why someone doesn't get saved. They do know a Christian and they don't know a Christian. That's why on this day, on this Memorial Day, I thought it might be good to stroll up and down the aisles of the devil's drugstore. I mean, after all, Dawn and I went shopping yesterday, and there were a lot of people out shopping yesterday, strolling up and down the aisles. 8.30 in the morning, and Sam's Club is swamped. 9, 9.30 in the morning, and Meyer is swamped. Okay? So I thought maybe in church today we might go shopping. Well, not shopping, strolling. Okay? Because we don't want to buy what the devil's selling. All right? But maybe we'll see what kind of Christians might be on the devil's drugstore shelves. So the first thing that we might see in the devil's drugstore are the hypodermic Christians. You know, this, this Christian that lives off of a periodic injection of religious excitement. They only come to church when they need a fix. They wait until they're broke. They wait until they find a lump. They wait until their children run away. They wait until they're being carried into divorce court. They wait until they get into a problem that the pain is so severe that they can't stand it anymore. Then they run to the church to get their fix. They stay out of church until they can't stand it anymore, and then they only come to church when they absolutely have to. They live from chill bump to chill bump. From thrill to thrill, never eating a steady diet of the word. Hypodermic Christians are special event Christians. You could announce that someone's going to be raised from the dead and they'll be there. You could announce that T.D. Jakes will be here and they'll be here. You could have some famous singer here like Bill Gaither or the Gaither Vocal Band, and guess what? They'll be here front and center. But you say that the pastor is going to be teaching on fasting and discipleship. (gasps) Well, I don't need that. Or you say, we're going to have a prayer emphasis service. Well, I, I don't need that. I pray enough at home. Over the meal, God is great, God is good, thank you for this food, amen. These type of people are revival chasers when the church ever has revival, by the way. They run from place to place looking for a thrill, but never settling down and putting down roots somewhere. Hypodermic Christians live from thrill to thrill and chill to chill and fix to fix. Hypodermic Christians. Well, you move on down the aisle, and there's the Rolaids Christian. Seeking only temporary relief. They're everywhere. They don't want an everlasting change in their life. They just want an ease from their discomfort. They're not into real repentance. They're sorry, but not sorry they broke the heart of God. They're usually sorry that they got caught. They don't want lasting help. 
They'd rather spend their time and money on spiritual rollades from the preacher than lasting heart surgery from Dr. Jesus. They say, doctor, just call off the surgery. Just touch up the x-ray. I just want temporary relief. Plop, plop. By the way, just so you know, Rolaids Christians consume 47 times their weight in the minister's time because they don't want... <laughs> Miss Jackie, <laughs> you usually sit in the back. I don't know whether I can stand you sit down front. <laughs> because they don't want lasting help. Between you and Anna, I tell you what, because they don't want lasting help. It's just temporary relief from their indigestion. Roll aids Christians. Well, then you have Novocaine Christians. These people couldn't feel the Holy Spirit moving in a service if it were screaming in a megaphone, shouting and throwing lightning everywhere. They come in with an attitude. Well, preacher, bless me if you can. I've had hell all week, and you just try and pick me up if you can. Well, the sermon's going to be dry this morning. I don't know why they have to sing so long. Why don't, and why don't we get out at 12 like other people? Why do we have to stay in church like we do? Why, why can't we sing the first, second, and last verse and get gone? 1 Timothy 4.2 says their conscience, has, their conscience has been seared with a hot iron. Have you ever tried to talk with a Novocaine Christian? When you are so excited about what God is doing, I mean, you're about to come out of your skin and they just sit there like bumps on a pickle. Wishing you'd just shut up. Wishing you'd hurry up and get through with your story already because God moves into service. People are really worshiping, lifting hands, shouting. And they sit back there and say, Lord, have mercy. I don't believe these people. What they said about this place, that reputation of Columbus West Church is true. Can't feel a thing. You notice that it's Novocaine Christian who thinks everyone else is abnormal. But I want to tell you this morning, it is abnormal not to feel. It's normal to feel. You go into a church where there are Novocaine Christians and the Holy Spirit starts to move and you raise your hand, watch out because one of the deacons will carry you out. Now that's Abby Normal. If you want to raise your hand or you want to shout in worship to the Lord, that's normal. Abnormal is when the Holy Spirit is moving and you sit there saying, I dare you to move me. I'm telling you right now, heaven is not going to be a Novocaine place. Well, I don't know why you got to get so loud. God ain't deaf. Well, no, He isn't, but He ain't nervous either. Well, you move on down the aisle, because I know you're all hungry, so we'll kind of pick up speed here a little bit. And you go down to the Band-Aid Christians. These people who are like... These, these are people who are like little children. Put on a band-aid so that they can get attention. You see my boo-boo? You see my boo-boo? They just want you to look at their boo-boos. The church is full of band-aid Christians. They wear their feelings on their sleeves. Don't ask them how they feel. Uh, that is unless you have about 30 minutes. Because they will tell you every little hurt and every little ache and every little pain that they have. 
You walk up to them rejoicing. You walk up, you, you talk with them, and 30 minutes later, after, you leave in a state of depression yourself. Don't ask the Band-Aid Christian, how you doing? Because nobody, nobody's ever been as sick as they are. You know the people? Everything anybody's ever had, they had it worse. They're the ones who read the Pepto-Bismol bottle and contract three new ailments. You know who they are? Some of them will ask you for a cigarette so they can get their breath right before they die, and then they'll turn to you and say, well, they help me breathe. They dwell on their problem constantly, always looking at their band-aids. You know what they want? They want everyone else to look at them too. And the tragic thing about them is that most of them have had their band-aids on so long that the hurt is already healed. But because they don't know it, because they haven't taken off the band-aid, they don't know that God has already healed them years ago. And so they're still talking about their boo-boos. And it's tragic because churches are full of people like that. Now, it's not wrong and a sin to be hurt. It's not wrong and a sin to be wounded. It's not wrong and a sin to be infected. It is wrong and it is a sin to live in a state of infection and then to spread your infection to everybody else and to live in a state of misery and pain, showing everybody else your pain so that your whole life revolves around your pain. These people don't want to be healed because they, they wouldn't get the attention that they crave. They wouldn't have anything to talk about if God healed them. So they just leave the band-aid on. They draw attention to the hurt that is there. You, you see, you see, church, it's already healed. And if no, and, and if you looked, you couldn't even see your boo boo. But that's where their life revolved around their pain. Oh, I was so wounded, so I'll never trust anyone again. I was so wounded at that church, so I'll never go to church again. You do that to me, you'll never do that again. I just want to tell you, I, I'll just, I just never am going to get any better. Your grandpa was a Band-Aid. Our whole family wear Band-Aids. We've kept Band-Aids in business. Well, now... I do have one backslidden sister. She's a curad. But we, we've all got band-aids. The whole, their whole life is about the hurt. How life is so unfair to them. I have three words for you. Get over it. Take the band-aid off. Throw that old, infected, nasty thing away. Enjoy the healing and go on and do what God is calling you to do. Stop living and making an idol out of your band-aid and your past hurt. Nobody wants to see your nasty old band-aid. Nobody wants to see your boo-boo. Go on with your life and grow up. Oh, now, we move on down past the Band-Aids and you move into Maybelline Christians. Now, some of you youngsters may not know what Maybelline Christians are, but they do still sell Maybelline products, okay? But Maybelline Christians, that spiritual beauty just throbs on them on the outside, but on the inside... 
they just as ugly as sin. Take that makeup off and whoo, baby, put that back on. Some would rather come to church with no makeup on in the physical rather than no makeup on in the spiritual. Why? Because we're trying to show people that we're prettier than we are on the inside. They cover up the real, their real self by appearing to be nice and spiritual. Some might have done this on the way to church this morning. You fussed and cussed all the way to church. But when you pulled into the parking lot, you got out of the car and said, Well, hello there, Pastor Watts. Wow. Isn't this a beautiful day? The sun has come out. Some of you can't even enjoy the message and the worship this morning because she had the last word when you got out and you've been trying to think of what you will say when you get back in. So that you can have the last word when you get home. You've threatened to kill the kids then pose them all nice and neat for a pic on Facebook in front of the church so that people will see what a good parent you are. John, why are your boys looking at you? I'm sorry, I just keep looking over that way. I got to quit picking on that family. They'll, quit, they'll stop coming. Um, I personally believe that hair dryers and commodes are going to send more people to hell than anything else. I mean, think about it. You don't fight over that stuff until Sunday morning. <laughs> Sunday rolls around and, well then, let's all just stay home because I'm not going to church looking like this. But when you finally get here, it's a totally different story. I wish, I wish we could have a video recorder hidden in the dash of your car while you're driving to church and then play it for you on the big screen when you get here. Johnny, why are you shaking your head no? Okay. Because, because I'd like to see you, I would like for you to see the difference when you crawl out of that car. Because when you crawl out and you say, praise God, that's Maybelline. You put on your spiritual makeup. When you get home, you take it off, especially when you sit down to the dinner table. It's not food you have, you have roast preacher. You go out of here shaking the preacher's hand and you say, Oh, bless God, I love you, preacher. Wonderful message. You get home. I don't know why they I don't know why they don't get somebody else to do that down there at that church. You gripe about the ones that are, but you aren't doing anything either. But when you come in and you hug that same neck with all kinds of affection and you kiss on that same face that, that you have gossiped and lied about all week long, you come in here and hug them and go and say, she has always smelled like that. I sure do wish she'd take a bath before she comes to church. What is that odor anyway? Midnight at Columbus? But next Sunday... You put that makeup on and hug her and say, Oh, darling, I just love you. I just look forward to hugging you every Sunday. Maybelline. <laughs> Miss Jackie, you got to sit down front more often. Next one, odor eater Christians. Always looking for something bad to absorb. Don't tell them any good news. They will never call you. Never text or message you with good news. It will always be bad. 
when they say, did you hear about? Hang up. Or if they say, I've got something I just want you to pray about. If they're odor eater Christians, watch out, bad news is coming. Uh, Maybelline and odor eater Christians are right side by side on the shelves. Odor eater never hears good about the church. They don't hear about all the good stuff that's going on. Just the bad. Never hear good about the preacher. Never hear good about the music. Never hear good about the leaders. They only sniff out the bad in everything. Don't tell me anything good. I don't want anything boring and good. Just give me the bad and juicy stuff. Have you ever taken an odor eater out of your shoe? Anybody still use odor eaters? Have you ever used odor eaters? I have. I used to use them in my tennis shoes. You ever taken one out? One that's been in there about six months? Put it up to your nose? And go on. Did you ever notice that the odor eater Christian smells like the stuff they've been sniffing? Because you are what you eat. Mike Warnke, who's a, who was a Christian comedian, said, if you eat fat, greasy food, you'll be a fat, greasy dude. These folks wonder why in the world God doesn't ever move. Why they're in such a state of depression all the time. Why nobody wants to be around them. It's because they have been smelling out all the bad stuff and you are what you eat. Be careful that folks don't mistake you for a trash can. Some of you, God is trying to do some good things in your life, and you're letting the devil pour things in your ears and in your lives that is negative. Everything God is trying to do, you're not a garbage can. Do you know how to end gossip? Never give it a receptacle. Because if you sit and listen to it, you're as guilty as the one telling it. You're an odor eater. Tell them, tell them that want to gossip to you to take it to the devil and let him hear about it. You don't need that stuff. Ask God to put an angel to guard your ears so that what goes in your spirit is not going to make you smell or be tainted. Scripture says whatever things are good and lovely and holy and just and good and godly and of good rapport, think on these things. There's one more stop in the devil's drugstore. Just one more. Alka-Seltzer Christians. And we have a lot of these in the church today. They start out with a lot of racket, a lot of noise, and then they fizzle out to nothing. When you drop those things in the water and let them sit there long enough, you can't even tell there's anything there but water. What are you saying, preacher? Alka-Seltzer Christians get excited about something and it lasts about five minutes. They're the first ones to sign up and the last ones to show up. They never follow through with anything they start. They get a great idea and say, We ought to do this! They get everybody excited and enlisted. Then when it's time to do that, where are they? Fizzled out. They get you committed and they leave you holding the bag. All right. Enough about the devil. Let's hop across the street and get into the Lord's drugstore, shall we? 
Because if we're going to be any Christian on the shelf, we need to be out of the devil's drugstore and get into God's drugstore. And there's really only one thing that we need to be. Penicillin Christians. A penicillin, penicillin doesn't see the body as a problem. It doesn't attack the body. It attacks the outside disease and bacteria that's trying to destroy the body. Penicillin Christians realize we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against the devils of this world. The enemy is not anybody that we can see. You're not my enemy. I can see you. You're not my enemy. I'm not your enemy. It is the spiritual forces that we cannot see. The ones that influence the people that are around us. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody was a penicillin Christian? That when they saw an infection, they didn't try to go magnify it. They would go and try to eradicate it. Wouldn't it be wonderful that when you see a brother having a problem, you wouldn't go over beside them so that you look better and say, look at the problems that they're having and look at how much more spiritual I am. Wouldn't it be wonderful that instead of trying to cover up one another's sins, we would go to that person and say, I'm going to walk through this with you until we eradicate this problem because I want you healthy. I want you well because you see, we are only as healthy as the weakest member of this body. Every one of us has areas in our lives that we need a shot of penicillin. Nobody in here, nobody in here is perfect in every area. I don't care how long you've been saved. Nobody in here is perfect in every area. I don't care how much scripture you've memorized. Nobody in here is perfect in every area. I don't care how long you've served in leadership. Nobody in here is perfect in every area. I don't care how many years you've pastored. Nobody in here is perfect in every area. Had to include the preacher over here. Nobody in here is perfect in every area. I don't I don't care how many years you've been the pastor's wife. Nobody in here is perfect in every area. I got your back. I don't care who you are. One person over here might be struggling with something that you over here might not be. You have the victory over it. But you might be struggling with something that they already have the victory over. And you see, you both have penicillin to share with one another that will help one another. Penicillin Christians realize that the enemy is not inside the camp. The enemy is the alien forces on the outside that is trying to get into the camp and invade and destroy what God is doing. Wouldn't it be good if we were all penicillin Christians into promoting healing the body rather than division in the body? Wouldn't it be good that the only reason we sought out ugly things was to kill it rather than to magnify them and make ourselves look better? Wouldn't it be wonderful if our only aim in this body was to eradicate anything that was hurting anybody in this body and make our focus to be we want to make Jesus' desire to come after a spotless bride. Jesus doesn't want a diseased bride. 
He doesn't want a bride that's dying from a cancer of unforgiveness. He doesn't want a bride that has bad breath for God. He's coming after a bride that is spotless without blemish till we all come into the unity of faith. Building up one another. Every joint supplied. Every joint doing what it's supposed to be doing. I am not pleased to God. I am not pleased to God until I have alleviated your pain and made you better. In the body, we are to minister one to another for the good of the whole body. Examine yourself. What kind of Christian have you been? Do you spend as much time fighting Satan as you do fighting certain men, members of the body? Are you promoting healing in the body? Do you follow through faithfully what you start? Or is it plop, plop, fizzle out? What do you spend most of your time absorbing? Because that's what you are. As a man thinketh, so is he. So you thought I was making up odor eater Christians, didn't you? It's scriptural. As a man thinketh, so is he. What do you really look like under your spiritual Maybelline? What are you keeping in the dark that no one else knows? That's the real you. Nothing more. Nothing less. Scripture says, search me, Lord. Search me. We have enough sense to know that you aren't like you are here all the time. Guess what? I'm not either. Just ask her. I am what I am in the dark. You are what you are in the dark. Nothing more. Nothing less. That's your character. What you are here is a front and show. Can I say, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O oh God. Can I say, search me and try me to see if there is anything wicked in me? Shine the light of the Holy Spirit on my life in every crevice of my being and eradicate anything that is not of you? Do you still dwell on the things that God healed years ago? All of us in here have been hurt. The victory doesn't come from the hurt. The victory comes from living beyond it and through it and going on and letting it be the past. Take off your band-aid and go on with your life. Are you sensitive to the Spirit and expect God to meet your need in the services that you attend? Or are you, have you come in, have you come in here for a shot full of Novocaine? Do you seek lasting help or temporary relief? Are you a Rolaids Christian? Or are you a are you on a steady diet of the Word of God? Or just a periodic fix? Where you say, I'll come and get excited when I have to. God's wanting some steady, steadfast stickability in His children. We don't need thrill seekers. We don't need signs. We don't need believers following signs. We need signs following believers. That only came through mature, steadfast Christians. Church, examine yourselves to see whether you are still in the Christian faith. Test yourselves. 
Don't you recognize that you are people in whom Jesus Christ lives? Could it be? Could it be? That we're failing the test? What shelf are you on? What kind of Christian are you? I don't know about you, but as far as me, and my challenge to you is, let's be penicillin Christians. Let's minister healing in the body. Let's leave people better, not bitter. Let's do what Jesus would do when we, when we find infection. Let's get out of the devil's drugstore and get into God's. Let's stay together.